This meeting is being recorded. Hello to everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanner Swift and I'll be your moderator for this session. I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Julio Guerrero and Nasli Giastalev. But before I hand the mic over to our presenters, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover about this presentation. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available on demand after the live session. We will provide you with some of those details at the end. Also, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. During the session, if you are on WebEx with us and have any question for our presenters, please submit them through the Q&A panel where our wonderful panelists are ready to respond. We will also have a couple poll questions for you to participate in today, so be on the lookout for those throughout the webinar. We will provide those polling questions through the Slido panel for you to provide your answers when we get to those. If you experience any audio issues, please use the call-in number displayed on the chat screen. I will post that once again momentarily. So without further ado, I'd like to kick things off by kicking it over to Julio. Julio, over to you. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. So on today's webinar, I uh, will go over a few topics that will be very interesting for you. Uh, first of all, we will uh, show you a little bit on the new Catalyst Center, formerly known as uh, Cisco DNA Center Virtual Clients on ESXi. Uh, how can you deploy it? What are the requirements and resources needed? And then we will uh, review some of the new key features on Catalyst Center 237. We have some new enhancements for day zero automation, as you can see, third party device support now, and we will review all the APIs that we have new on this software version. Now, uh, moving forward, we would like to know more a little bit about the environment you are running in. Uh, the Catalyst Center you are currently uh, running on your network, if you have uh, 2.1x or below, 2.2.2.3.2 in between, 2.3 or above, 2.3.5, or you don't have any Catalyst Center installed yet, uh, we would like to know. Uh, so uh, we, we will see the uh, Slido coming up for you. And uh, if you can respond, it will be really helpful to, for us to know how's uh, your deployment going. Now for today's discussion, uh, we will go over the Catalyst Center on ESXi, and then we will see all the new feature for uh, different topics that you can see for NetOps, AOps, SecOps, and DevOps. So moving forward on Catalyst Center on ESXi. Uh, the Catalyst Center on ESXi and this version 237 will become available quite soon for you, but today we would like to show some of the new main features and capabilities. Uh, many, of you, uh, many of you may have heard about this new Catalyst Center naming. Uh, this is formerly known as Cisco DNA Center. You know, this is a great network management tool that provides improved agility to control and supervise your network. will give you a, a great insights taken from assurance, and you can automate a, a lot of tasks on your network. Now, uh, this year we came with the uh, uh, AWS uh, Catalyst Center option, and now we will have available for you the virtual appliance on VMware ESXi, so you can deploy that on your uh, virtual environment on your premises. Now, uh, you know, uh, when you start using virtualization, you will have a lot of benefits, such as flexibility, uh, cost savings, and also lead time. Uh, whenever you order your um, Catalyst Center, there's not going to be extra charge for you. It will come included on the Catalyst Essentials and Catalyst Advantage subscriptions. There's going to be an option for you to get support for it, so it's recommended when you're placing your order. At the end of the session, we will share with you the ordering guide. Also, you can see that the feature party comes along with the DN2 hardware appliance with 44 cores, so the features and uh, scalable uh, numbers for it will be matching the same. There should be small limitations that you can review on the release notes on what is supported now on the Catalyst Center on VMware. Now, it will rely also on the high availability using the VMware native functionality. Uh, high availability will rely on the um, ESXi itself. Uh, there is no option for today uh, to get a three node cluster, so single cluster plus the VMware uh, HA functionality will uh, give you all the uh, availability needed for now. And finally, the VMware uh, license. So uh, remember, when you, you still need to have your own VMware environment deployed with the licensing up to date in order to deploy at our uh, Catalyst Center on ESXi. 
Now, uh, moving forward to uh, specifications and scale. Uh, here you can see the cattle center BM specs that you can see. Uh, you will need to go get the OBA file. You will need 32 CPUs at least uh, for CPU. A uh, memory is 256 and storage it's required to have three terabytes. We do recommend to have a solid state drive uh, because of the requirements for IOPS and storage bandwidth, as you can see in here. For the server specifications, uh, ESXi minimum version required is 7.0. You will need at least a CPU from 2.1 gigahertz and above. The RAM required, because we're hosting the ESXi and the virtual clients, it's 264 on your server. And this is very important as well. Uh, you will need uh, two interfaces for enterprise and management. Uh, this can be a 10 gigabit uh, interface for enterprise with best practice and one gigabit interface uh, for the management. So remember to uh, plan ahead and to create your VMs uh, networks on your ESXi server. For scaling, it match again with the DN2, uh, the parity for uh, features on 237, and the scale numbers should be the same, 25,000 endpoints, 1,000 devices, switches, routers, and so on, 4,000 active points, and 2,500 sites when you're creating your hierarchy. Now, moving into uh, the workflow on creating a new VM on ESXi. First of all, you will need to download the OBA file from CCO. Again, this will become available quite soon for you. Uh, it's about 35 gigabits of the uh, uh, file size, so please be patient when you're downloading it. And uh, there will be two options for you to deploy that OBA on your virtual environment. It will take you between 25, 30 minutes. You can do either a manual installation using your vCenter or a standalone when you're using the ESXi host client. So you will need to download the OBA file on your local machine and then deploy that from there. Uh, you need to plan ahead by creating your VM network and to have everything handy because after this, you will move over the uh, configuration wizard. Either you can use the maglev or the install configuration web UI. And remember to have all the IP addressing for management, enterprise interfaces, uh, default gateways, NTP, DNS, proxy server if you need one to get out to the internet so you can configure your Catalyst Center. And after that, you will get into the Catalyst Center uh, ESXi GUI. Now, uh, an important note in here is the first login. It will be a default username and password for admin that we will review on a demo. And that uh, after that, you will be required to create a new user on your own and the admin will be deleted. So let's move forward on the demo. Just give me one second, please. As you change over, Julio, just want to uh, remind our attendees, um, if you do have a question for our presenters today, please use that Q&A panel. Also, the first poll question for today's session is now live. If you could please use the Slido panel to provide your answer, that would be great. Thank you. So let's uh, go over the demo back again. In here, uh, you can see I have a standalone ESXi host client. I have a client resources with 38 CPUs, 170 gigabits of RAM, and so on. Uh, if you're familiar with the ESXi environment, you can create in here a new VM. So whenever you create a new VM, you will see that you can create a virtual machine from an OBF or OBA file. If you click Next, you will assign a name for it, let's call it Catalyst on ESXi uh, webinar. And then you will select the file you will have already downloaded. I have here that locally with version 237. I will open it and will click next. And it will ask me to select the storage. In my case, I only have one uh, data store in here. Um, as you can see, I only have a capacity of one to three terabytes. It's strongly recommended to have the three terabytes assigned just for your uh, Catalyst Center VM, because if you do that uh, thick provisioning, it, it will not move forward. Since this is just a demo, and as you can see here for this provisioning, I will be using thin provisioning in here. You can select the other one, thick, and it, 
recommended for you when you are doing the um, production environment. Then for network mapping, uh, you can select the enterprise. I have already mapped my uh, VLANs for enterprise team management. So you can see the labels in here. You need to sign them as you move forward. And you can uh, power on automatic. I will unselect that for now and we click next. There is, is a small error message. We can ignore it because this is expected when you're doing is and I will sign. And then you can click on finish. I will cancel for now. I have created one VM for you already. And we will use a quick um, video recording for you. After the VM it's completed and it's set up, you will get into the Maglev configuration wizard welcome page. You will be asked to get the IP address for the enterprise. You need to type it down, IP address, NetMask, default gateway, or static routes, either one of those. And then you can click on configure. When you configure it, you will get the web installation URL. As you can see, it is an enterprise IP address on port 9004. If you click on skip, it will get you through the maglev wizard. But for today, we will use the web UI wizard, an installation wizard. So when I move to the URL, it will take me to the welcome to the DNA center virtual appliance. I will start a new appliance from here. I will do just a basic install and we click next or start, sorry. Will take me over the uh, overview of the workflow, everything that is required to be configured that we will see. Enterprise interface, it's already taken from what we configure. Intra cluster is not needed, it's predefined. After that, we will get asked for uh, DNS. Remember, DNS needs to be reachable because the uh, Catalyst Center will validate that during the installation. If you have a proxy, you can configure that in here. We will skip it and we'll click next. Now, there is no uh, cluster virtual IP address needed. We can uh, leave that blank. Uh, remember, there is no support for three node cluster, no need for virtual IP address. If you have a fully qualified domain name for your host, you can define it in here and then you can add your entity server. After that, subnets that are created already for containers and cluster they are predefined as well you'll need to type anything else and it will move forward uh, through the process of the install asking you for your cli credentials for maglev remember uh, if you want to go through cli and do some uh, travel tuning you will get uh, this password uh, uh, have it uh, handy and safe and you will need to match the password criteria, at least eight characters long, upper lowercase, one number, or a special character, and you can click next. It will give you a summary of all the configuration you have done. If you see, it's very quick. Everything is there, looks good, and then we will start configuration. Now, you will uh, take a look on all the logs on the appliance configuration while it's in progress. I will uh, forward this a little bit for ease of time. As you can see, it took me about 10 minutes to configure my Catalyst Center here from uh, the first initial settings to have it handy and complete in here. So after it's completed, you will see appliance configuration complete. You will get the credentials that you will use for first time in here, that it's the admin and maglev one at three. If you click on this uh, button, it will take you directly to the DNA Center uh, GUI. So Let's go back. I have it in here. This is operational. This is the VM that we have in here. Give me back. So this is the same VM. It's already up and running. I will click on uh, open your Cisco DNA Center. And it will take me to the login page. From here, just give me one second, please. Okay, you may, you may get that connection, it's not private. You can uh, proceed and accept. You can click on login. And again, this is where I will do the admin, username, and the Mac 
left one at three passwords, okay? So it will uh, get me prompt to provide a username that it's gonna be used for first time. After you create this username, I will use my, I will use my um, name and last name. It will give you a permission of super admin. And we will configure a password. Okay. Remember, after I create my first uh, username, it will delete the admin one. So I will need to get back logging with the user that I have created. And after that, you can start working on uh, your uh, users. Uh, you can create a new admin account if it's needed. And then you will be able to log in back to your Cisco DNA center, okay? So I'm logging in. And then we'll start uh, through that quick start process. It will ask me uh, to get my uh, CTO credentials. I can do it now or I can skip it. You can skip it and then from uh, the global settings, you can configure your uh, CCO ID in order to have access to uh, uh, system updates and so on. So I will skip it for now. You will get to the terms and conditions uh, and user license agreement. And after that, you will be prompt to get uh, the uh, other settings. So after that, you will be able to get uh, to the DNA center. So just give me one second here. And got this from here. Let me be sure. So after that, you will be able to start uh, the workflow on your DNA center, discover devices. We will be able to check the uh, version that you have installed already, 237, as you can see. Whenever you wanna check your serial number, you will see that it's a VMware and the serial number. You can check member ID uh, in order uh, to verify uh, anything uh, for telemetry and so on. And uh, from here, you can start working on anything that you set up initially on your uh, DNA center. We can verify that there are some available applications to get updated in here. And then you can also verify on the system 360 that you have all the services up and running, that everything is smoothly operating, and you can start discovering your devices. Remember, there's a, a, some initial setup needed, all the uh, CLI credentials, your site hierarchy, uh, everything that you usually do on an appliance to discover and manage your devices, you will need to do that in here. Uh, we do also uh, recommend you to uh, verify everything on the system settings, credentials, smart licensing, your smart account, add everything in advance uh, before you start discovering your network. And uh, also recommended, if you have some time, you can go to the uh, system health. And from there, you can create some validation runs. So these validation runs will be very handy. You can go to tools and then validation tool. And in there, you will be able to create a new validation run where you will be able to verify the virtual appliance infrastructure status and the appliance scale, as you can see in here. It will take some time to be completed. I will forward this of the recording a little bit, but from there you will be able to see the status of the services. And very important here, you can see the uh, CPU, uh, the memory that you're using, so you can make sure that the VM it's uh, good, that it's up and running, and will be ready to onboard your devices on your net. Okay.
So uh, from here, I will get uh, back to uh, Natalie so we can move over the uh, new features and capabilities on Catalyst Center 237. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Julio. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I will be taking over to go over uh, the, some of the new features that we have on uh, the new version of Catalyst Center 237. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so um, as you saw on the uh, slide that we uh, reviewed the agenda, uh, we have uh, divided the features into four different personas, NetOps, AIOps, SecOps, and DevOps. Uh, so we, uh, the features that you see here, they're not, it's not a comprehensive list. We have picked some of the uh, main features, but definitely I recommend you to go take a look at the um, release notes for 237, it has a comprehensive list of uh, all the new features under each persona in addition to the platform itself. So for NetOps, uh, uh, all the features within NetOps is just uh, the goal is to improve efficiency. Um, so one of the main features that is introduced under new release is the third party device support. Um, so we will see it is expanded across both NetOps and some aspects of uh, AIOps Assurance. Um, we will take a look at the visibility and control feature and see how it improves um, and uh, secures the configuration changes that you are making uh, over your network via Catalyst Center. Um, there is a new feature introduced. It's an enhancement uh, when you're uh, using CMP to onboard uh, wireless LAN controller 9800. Uh, now you have a day zero onboarding template. Uh, and for AIOps, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. For AIOps, uh, which uh, pretty much uh, translates to like the assurance. Uh, portion of Catalyst Center, which helps to improve the performance, look at the events and, and uh, uh, troubleshoot the issues that happen in your network. Um, one of the new features is the event analysis dashboard. Um, I'll explain to you what it does and we'll have a preview of the dashboard. Also, um, as I explained earlier, uh, I'll show you what are the aspects of uh, assurance that fits into uh, all third-party devices that are supported with the new release. And uh, within the um, context of the SecOps, it's mainly focused on SD access to improve security and policy. Um, I will show you some of the new enhancements of the UI that is made uh, for uh, new automation for SD access. And lastly, uh, for uh, DevOps, um, I'll show you a short list of uh, new and enhanced APIs that are added with the new rig. All right, so let's start by going through, going through the NetApp features. So uh, let's start with third party device. So, uh, Majority of uh, you, I'm pretty sure, it's very common that um, all the IT organizations, they use uh, and deploy different devices. So um, if you look at your network deployment, uh, you may not have all uh, Cisco devices. You may be using other vendors for load balancers, firewalls, different uh, vendor wrappers or switches. So, this is fine, but the uh, problem with that is just added complexity and the management of the network becomes harder because you have to monitor your network from different points. 
So, and it has been a long time request from customers. And uh, the engineering heard the feedback and they uh, finally were able to add it, add the, this uh, feature. It is very early on, so uh, keep in mind that the capabilities within this feature is limited. So, uh, what you will uh, see here, uh, you, uh, when we talk about the uh, third party device support, keep in mind any type of third party device that uh, support uh, SNMP MIB2, which is RFP 1213 standard, um, is pretty much supported. So any device that can pull and populate SNMP uh, MIB2 can be added to Catalyst Center. So when it's added, um, you have some of the base automation features. So you will be able to uh, see it in the discovery and inventory support. And then moving on, I'll later show you what I'll mention is here. You will be able to see device uptime and then very limited visibility of device and technology, interface status, if it's up or down, and also see the, uh, pretty much the vendor, the type of the vendor of the device. And uh, when it comes to assurance, or the uh, and device 360 limited view. Keep in mind, even though you can add this, that if you run into an issue with your device set, um, Cisco doesn't support or troubleshoot uh, those third party devices. So you need to make sure that, you know, if there's an issue with that device, you need to open a uh, ticket with that uh, appropriate vendor. So um, I don't have a third party device in my lab, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you based on the um, screenshots that I have. Um, let me get my link there, pointer. So uh, once a device is added to the inventory, keep in mind that uh, third party devices, they are added and fall under core family and they show us the third party device. You, should, you see that the family is showing it's a third party device, and then the role of the device is a core. So when you go to your inventory, you can always see when you select your device, keep in mind that it will uh, fall on their core and the family will show up as third party device. Next topic is visibility and control. So this feature provides a solution to further secure your uh, plan network configuration before deploy, you can deploy, you want to deploy them on your device. With the enhanced, so and it has, it consists of two portions, visibility and control. With the enhanced visibility, you can enforce the previewing of your uh, device configuration, which consists of CLI and NetComp commands before you deploy them uh, on the devices. This preview can be seen among the majority of the Catalyst Center, uh, Catalyst Center applications. You will be able to use it for compliance remediation, configuration changes, wireless device configuration, and even in the SDA context for fabric configuration. And uh, with the enhanced control, Catalyst Center offers you more control over how your devices are configured through ITSM approval check. So this way you will make sure that you know you are doing a review and approving the changes that you're making. So I will actually go ahead and share my demo and so we can actually walk through this in a demo environment. Let me All right. So uh, who you can confirm if you can see the center? Yeah. It's good. 
All right. So, all right. So, um, we talked about the uh, visibility and control. Let's first verify where you can actually see where this configuration can be is enabled or can be enabled or disabled. So you just go to system settings and it should be under system configuration. You see the option, uh, the feature, visibility and control of configuration, which explains you the same thing that I walked you through. So by default, the configuration preview is enabled. Keep in mind that having this enabled as you walk through the workflows to con uh, make the configuration or changes, it makes it mandatory to uh, first do the preview and after that you can deploy. If you want to skip that, then you can turn it off. And for the control, you need to uh, pretty much to enable the ICSM and it's click here. We'll walk you through the steps in order to um, enable and integrate ICSM. And then after that's done, it shows you the bundle that needs to be enabled. After that's enabled, then you can pretty much enable the, uh, this box and uh, with that go to the control feature of it, which pretty much uh, enables the ITSM approval for the change. So now that is done, let me show you how you can actually, let's demonstrate this. So we go to provision inventory. So for example, I'll select my uh, core device, which is a uh, 9300. And then select on provision, and then I'll do provision the device. So the workflow first is assign, uh, assign the site, which is already done. And then here, uh, it shows my device. It shows the template. We already have a template created for it that's like the changes that you're making, which is called test. So that is selected and uh, click on next. Do a review. So before provisioning the device, you have the option now, later, and generate configuration preview. Because you have it enabled, which is enabled by default on any release. So you, the, as you can see the now and later options are grayed out. So you, it is mandatory. If you want to skip this, then you need to disable the uh, visibility uh, from the path that I showed you. But once it's done, you just apply this. Uh, I had the one already created, I'll discard that one and then it goes through the uh, preview. So it will take a few minutes or it, it really depends on what you have or how big is the uh, changes that you're making. So at this point, once this is done, you can continue with deployment or if you just leave, exit and preview later or if you just completely leave, this is done. So uh, let me walk you through this first. So you can see the configure source from all. You can do, take a look at only the intent config. You can only look at the CLI template or the telemetry and the rest of the settings. So you can uh, move with the deploy or if you just exit and preview later, if it shows you that if you do not wish to wait for the process to complete, you can leave this space and later on, you can go to activities uh, and work items window, which you can go here and work, work items, whatever uh, uh, item that the provision device is what we created and we didn't proceed with the deployment, you can come back later and then click on it and uh, proceed with the deployment. 
Let's move on to the next feature for NetApp. Let me bring back. Okay, this is good. I don't have to stop shit. All right, so um, last feature that I will cover uh, for net network operations is a, a new feature, or pretty much it's, an, it's not a new feature, it's an enhancement that is made for the plug and play uh, uh, for onboarding wireless LAN controllers. It is specific to 9800 wireless LAN controllers. Uh, before this version, before 237, um, uh, WLC, this uh, 9800 was on, uh, we could not use the day zero or onboarding template uh, attached to it during the uh, PMP process. Why? Because there was a potential for the configuration uh, within the template to override the intent configuration. But with this new release, what is coming? You can now deploy the template uh, to the 9800 during the onboarding process. And uh, so there are two ways to mitigate the overriding of the intent during this process. If you don't have that um, visibility enabled and you proceed with the uh, uh, PMP process, it will give you a real-time conflict warning during the template creation. And if the visibility feature is enabled, so you pretty much give you a warning during the PMP claim process when deploying that template. So when we, with this, you will have the ability to revert the changes that could cause a conflict to your intent uh, or override the warning. And um, as you can see here, let me show you, but I think it's better to go ahead and show you this in the lab. But so pretty much what you will see here uh, when you actually create your network profile for uh, wireless, you will, uh, like if you log into your, uh, if you're on 235 or any previous releases, you only have, if you log into it and go to your wireless network profile, you only have day and template. There is no day onboarding template, which is day zero. And uh, what you will pretty much do is, uh, which I will show you in my lab device, is going to the through the claim process for plug and play, and you will have the this uh, section which you select your template. Um, all right. So for this, we go to provision. You're showing the plug and play. I have a uh, wireless LAN controller 9800. It's, as you see, it is on claim. So I'll select it, claim, claim process. Okay, we are missing our uh, site. Let's just assign it to a site. And then you click on next. Um, you see under the configuration, there are, so this is very similar to the same, the current the PMP client claim process, right? So here we are missing the ima image that we want to load on the, the wireless LAN controller, the template, and then um, uh, here pretty much they all show up under the configuration page. So we, you, in order to add the image which you currently do in the uh, current uh, claim process, you just go to image repository and add the image that you want to put on the, uh, this WLC, and then the configuration of the WLC folder under here, uh, which is similar to what you already do. What is changed is the create, uh, selecting your template. This is a template that uh, I'll show you where you actually, you should already know this because you're already doing it for the, your template on non-wireless PMP process, but this is pretty much where you select your, um, what is it called, uh, day, day zero onboarding template, and uh, then proceed, uh, save it and then proceed with the claim. And where you actually can see the, uh, uh, network profile, and then uh, here is what we have for our, uh, uh, 
oh sorry, this is the, the day zero uh, temper. And then the template that I wanted to show you, sorry, my bad. You go under tools, uh, template hub, and that the template, the zero template fall under, let's, you will see it here if you have a long list of templates, you can pretty much filter it based on device family, right? We want to look at the WLC controller. This is the template that we are using uh, for the RPMP uh, crank product. All right, so this is pretty much what I was able to fit in a short amount of time we have to cover the main features um, for NetApp. Let's move on to the next topic, which is, oh, we have a poll question. Um, so if you can activate the poll question, the uh, second poll, what features do you currently uh, use uh, with your tablet center? TMP, the 360 views from client or device 360, assurance even viewer, APIs, or none of the above. And poll question two is now live. If you could use the Slido panel to provide your responses. Thank you. All right. So while that is open, um, we move to the next slide. So next topic is AI app, which we are all know it and use as the assurance part and analytics part of a salary ordinary center. So um, even analytics dashboard is a new feature. Um, and what is the point of it? So network devices that you have in your, uh, that are added in and uh, monitored by your entire center, they can generate a huge number of events that uh, are related to your network infrastructure and the users that you have on your network. But because you have a huge amount of data, it can make it challenging for us to, or for any network admin, to correlate all these events to understand which ones are relevant. So with this new feature, uh, it uses uh, pretty much AI to provide network administrators insights into the events that are most relevant or least relevant. So, and it, is, it works for both wired and wireless. And it shows you pretty much, for example, when are the events happening the most? What are the highest priority events? Which events the types? are the most common or the least common uh, type of event. And uh, so the dashboard itself, uh, which I'll show you uh, on the demo that we have, uh, but this is pretty much a screenshot of it. It gives you a visualization of syslog messages and which as you can see here, we have the syslog messages and reachability uh, uh, transition. So pretty much network events that allow the user to identify, and with that you will be able to identify the trends and correlate the events across the different data sources that you have. So, and as you can see, this showing up as a uh, heat map. So this display the format of heat map of syslog and reachability transitions. And keep in mind, as you can see, it's working for both wired, supported for both wired events and wired. So let me bring back our lab. Oh, yeah. So we go to assurance, issues and events. So this is pretty much this third tab is what is uh, added uh, on this new release. This is a example a preview of the data, but uh, pretty much what you will see when you actually, when the release is DA, so you will be able to, from global, select the specific site, building, or place that you want to take a look at the data for that, and you will have the option to select your time range. And then you have the breakdown of selecting wired events or wireless. And in the syslog, you, you, you can use the time selector to select the, that interested range of time that you want to look at. 
um, we have more breakdown of, you know, high so high severity events, rare events, high volume events, which you can, for each pretty much uh, representation of these types, you will be able to get digging more uh, in the details by clicking on these details. And uh, lastly, you just have the selected messages of the syslog that are selected uh, here. So, uh, and yeah, you should be able to see this like in the live and do the filtering when the release becomes a, a general available. So, let's move back to the next feature for AI Ops for Assurance which is the third party device support. So um, in the context of automation and network operations, uh, we saw that we did the, um, once the third party device is added to the inventory, what, where we can see it and what information is available. So in addition to the automation, there is some level limited or there is some support of the third party device in assurance dashboard. Um, it is only available for wired assurance on this release. Uh, and you can uh, pretty much uh, uh, monitor and tr uh, troubleshoot the devices from either overall <laughs> health dashboard network and the device 360 uh, assurance health dashboard. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, even for the inventory, when the third party device is added to Tally Center, it is mapped on their core device family. And uh, also, uh, if you go under the issues, you can view the issues generated for third party devices. Um, keep in mind, the issues uh, are limited comparing to supported devices. So you will only see uh, certain type of issues like reachability and interface related issues. Um, so this is, since I don't have a third party device, I'll show you this and I'll show you what is the difference between a supported and third party device on the device 360 view. So this is a Palo Alto the firewall device that is added to the Cali Center, you can see it under device 360. So the, the information under device 360 contains issues, event viewer, device info, and uh, interfaces. So, um, but in any other supported device, you will be able to see uh, additional information, I think four more categories that you will be able to see. Uh, let's just explore that and see what is the difference. But overall, even with uh, this amount of information that is provided, it's a big change based on your request to be able to get visibility of uh, third party devices on the Catalyst Center. So for a uh, for a uh, supported device, you have issues. So what we are missing is the physical neighbor topology. We have event viewer, Patrick. We don't have that visibility as well as application experience. We don't have these device info and interfaces are what you will see on the third party device. So let's go to setup. We are also running out of time. I'll just go through this quickly. So we have more uh, enhancements on the SC access, but there were major changes made on 235. So compared to that, we have a few enhancements uh, on the new release. Uh, so we, uh, I'm just gonna go through one of the main things that we have. So the enhanced SCA user interface is just uh, provides, uh, uh, it, made, it has made it very much simpler and more flexible, and uh, the user interface is more intuitive. Uh, so you, it, you, you will be able to have a, uh, so pretty much have a separate page to configure 
uh, virtual networks, transit, and fabric cell. In each of these pages, it had an overview and table, which I will show you uh, momentarily on our uh, lab. And you can customize the table on a page to display it on what uh, uh, column you want to view. And uh, so when you do the overview page for the fabric site, uh, show you some uh, tips and insights for a fabric site and fabric zone, how to create it. And also we have simplified work and these workflows on, are in progress and also we have simplified the workflow. And uh, actually this is not fabric site, I think it's on the virtual network. Uh, um, so the page I can provide multiple tab. You will see the layer two, layer three, the layer two net virtual networks, layer three, fabric infrastructure setting for any cache gateway, wireless SS, uh, SSID port assignment and authentication template. So I'm just going to show you what we see on the new uh, user interface for SDA. Um, so. We have a few enhancements on land automation, but I didn't include them since we have limited time. But as you can see under C access, you have fabric size, virtual network, and separate pages for each one. Um, we have different, so they, which kind of transit back to these three. Under fabric size, you have the summary, which shows you how many fabric size, fabric zones, devices, and fabric rules, and total devices. And this is where it shows you, like gives you information of what fabric size is, and then well, it talks, it talks about the fabric zone and how to create fabric size. The second view that we have is pretty much very similar to what we used to have, which is, uh, let me go to virtual network, which we have some data. You can see this. This is pretty much similar to what we used to see. This is in a table view, layer three configuration, layer two, any cast and extranet policy. And similarly, we have transit. And also you will see the task uh, that uh, pretty much transit task in, in the place, because as I remember from 235, uh, uh, no, this, but this is added recently. Um, so this is what I have for, uh, oh, this is what I had on the slide. So for the virtual network, uh, you have the breakdown of, the, so the workflows are simplified, the workflows are separated, and uh, pretty much you, let's do, for example, one fabric site. Oh, I wanted to show you this. So when you create a fabric site, let's select, this for example, here we have. So we select our site. I'm going to select none for now. We're demonstrating. And I'll just do the uh, fabric. So I'll set up the fabric zone later. We have the summary of our configuration in place. So here, as you can see, since we have enabled the visibility, the, uh, the deployment and it will not kick in unless we go through the overview uh, or preview first. Once this is done, then you can, I mean, this is like an empty setup that I have, but the process of workflow shows you. Once this is done, then you can proceed with the deployment. So you see that how the, uh, the um, uh, that the feature for uh, pretty much uh, visibility and control is applicable to almost more, most of the workflows and features in the new version of Gallery Center. And um, let's move on to the last persona, which is DevOps. So, uh, so uh, on the new release, what, uh, so overall, let's just talk a minute about the API. So the DNA uh, Family Center, I apologize, I'm still getting used to using Family Center over DNA Center. So the Family Center user interface, um, when you go to the, I'll walk you through where you can actually use the API, but pretty much displays the documentation about uh, each API call. 
and uh, it will do the request method and the URL, the query parameters and uh, responses, what type of response you will expect to see, and ways to preview or test the request. So we do not have a one-on-one uh, -on -one parity for the API calls today, but on each release, we are adding and enhancing APIs, adding more APIs to match each and every capability within the catalyst center. So for, um, this is again, not, is not a comprehensive list. I recommend you to go to, we will share you the link. I recommend you to go to the 237 release note. You can get a uh, comprehensive list of APIs to take a look at what are all the new and added enhanced APIs. But just to go over some of the main ones, the devices API, you will be able to get the device interface status, uh, stat information with site APIs. What was added is uh, getting a site, get, get site version two, uh, get the number of uh, site counts, and then get devices that are assigned to a site for compliance. Uh, the new API, one of two, two of the new APIs, one is getting configuration task details, and uh, second one is committing the device configuration. And uh, very good news, we have a LAN automation API, uh, if you are adding on SD, SDA underlay, uh, to, for, to, so we have an API for LAN automation stuff and update devices, and also LAN automation device updates. Let me show you if you have not used the API before, if you want to get familiarized with. So to access, you go to platform, developer toolkit. So the first tab is API. On the left side, you have all the APIs in different categories. So you can either use these or also if you are looking for a specific API, you can search for it. But just for the sake of demonstration, let's do, we have, for example, site is was one of the ones I showed you. Uh, for example, we want to do get site. So how you can use this, it shows you the API call, so we have different tabs and it is different, it varies for different APIs, depends on what you will see. But you pretty much see the different parameters if they are mandatory. So this is a get request, but if it's a post and if it's a, a parameter that is mandatory required or not, the default value, it shows you the different type of responses that you will get so, for example, here, if it's a, you will get a 200 response if it's a request for successful, and it actually shows you in detail what are the information you will see. And for example, 400, 401, so it, it shows you the state of each response that you will get and what it means. And then you have the code preview. So it will show you the code that will pretty much be used. Um, and make sure before using the API, there are prerequisites in order to use the API. You're selecting the language that you're using, if it's Python, install the PIP, um, or, and also the uh, token, authentication token. So make sure the prerequisites are met, and then you can start using the API. And then you can, it also provides you with an option to try that API call. So I'm just gonna run this for an example we are getting the size, so getting the size that we have. So we got a status code 200, which means we got the response. And as you can see, uh, so it's uh, pretty much, I mean, I'm not gonna go through all it in detail, but if you go back to the, the 200 that was showing, which value translates to what information, but it's pretty much showing us the uh, size hierarchy that we have, global United States, and then we have the Richardson and different floors that we have. So this is, um, and again, so make sure to take a look at uh, uh, all the new APIs if you have already been using it. If not, just you can uh, start going through some basic uh, APIs and then uh, get comfortable with it and start utilizing this. Um, 
furthermore, to use the new APIs and the new relay. And uh, with that, uh, um, so I want to uh, wrap up the session just making sure with the new release coming, it is not a GA release yet, but it's coming uh, soon, I think sometime in October. Um, Mid-October for now is the estimated ETA that we have, but it may change. But if you're interested in upgrading to use any of these new features and capabilities, so here is the upgrade path. You can also, so I'm going to show you pretty much self-explanatory, but pretty much if you have 235, um, it's a one-step upgrade. And then if prior to that release, you need to go to 235, go to 237. Oh, I'm <laughs> Um, and so pretty much uh, if any any uh, release prior to 235, you will have multi-hub upgrade. And to make sure that you are following the correct path of, of upgrade, use the we will share the um, we'll share the link with you. But make sure to review the upgrade guide uh, to understand the steps that you need to take in order to proceed with the upgrade. And uh, to wrap up the session, a few items. Um, key points for you to take away. Cali Center on ESXR comes in a uh, new virtual form factor, which speeds up the deployment and operation for customers. Uh, VMware Spirit's high availability ensures the continuous operation for the uh, Cali Center. Uh, with the new support of third party device, it provides you greater visibility over your entire network, not only Cisco uh, devices. And with the LAN automation has been um, upgraded to allow simultaneous LAN automation stations. And uh, with the new APIs called, so the idea of using the APIs is to help, to help you enhance the overall network experience by optimizing your end-to-end -end, uh, processes. And with that, uh, we, uh, have finished the session. Um, we have a few uh, links from release notes, user guides, upgrade guides, uh, and also how to pretty much install the calorie center on the ESXi house order. Um, and we will share it with you. And uh, do we have any time for questions or is there any outstanding questions? Thank you, Nasli. Yeah, we'll take um, we'll, we will take a, a few moments here just to answer um, a couple questions, and and feel free whether uh, you or Julio want to uh, take these. Um, let's let's just dive into a couple questions here. How much does Catalyst Center VA for ESX cost? I can take that one. So the Catalyst uh, Center uh, virtual machine VA software on ESXi. It would be provided to you at no charge. It will come included on the Catalyst Essentials and Advantage software subscriptions. Uh, again, if you want to learn more about how to order it uh, with the support itself as well, uh, please uh, take a look on the ordering guide that we'll be sharing with you in a minute. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, let's get to another one here. Um, is Catalyst Center VA compatible with ESXi cloud servers like AVS, Google Cloud Services, or AWS Cloud? Uh, well, as for now, and you know, we have the AWS option. Uh, there is uh, no support as for now for Azure or Google Cloud. So you can rely either on the ESXi on-prem or AWS Cloud or the physical appliance. Perfect. Let's um, let's get to one more uh, question here. I see one. I see one last yeah, question on the uh, yeah. So there's a question, uh, last question on the Q and A, which is unanswered. On dashboard, do we get oh, yes. all environments that yeah status issues uh, from other vendors' devices or just some of them? So uh, with the third party device, uh, we uh, only get reachability, so if device is reachable or unreachable, and we get interface related data. So if the interface is like discard, drop, when it comes to the device, there is no 
KPIs like CPU, memory, those are not supported for third-party devices. And uh, you don't have uh, any uh, help for customization uh, at all. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see here. Um, that does do it for all of our, our time at this point. Um, Julio or Nasli, would you guys have anything that you want to uh, touch on real quick before we do wrap up? No, I just wanted to uh, thank you uh, um, for taking the time. I hope you found this um, session helpful. Make sure to use the release notes. We can look at there are much more enhancements and features coming in the new release. Um, so we'll just go through them and hopefully you'll be able to use the new features. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Uh, thank you to you both. Uh, thank you to all our panelists. I want to thank the whole team for bringing your knowledge to the Cisco community today. Uh, if you do have a question for our presenters, we'll keep the Q&A window open for a couple more minutes. Uh, we'll also keep those poll questions up for like another day or so if you want to go in and provide your responses through Slido as well. For even more tutorials, demonstrations, and future webinars, please visit the Cisco Learning Network. Recordings will be uh, linked on the Cisco Learning Network through the learning plan. This live stream will also be available to go back uh, and watch as well. I will provide a link in the chat screen momentarily. Your feedback is important to us, and at this time, you'll be directed to a post-webinar survey. Please take the time to participate in that. It helps us plan out future sessions. Uh, we also have a post-webinar discussion where we are interested in hearing your takeaway uh, from today's session. And if you have any further questions, you can ask those there as well. I've provided a link to that post-webinar discussion in the chat screen. Once again, we thank everybody for joining us today, and we will see you next time on the Cisco Learning Network.